Hi, thanks for having me. So we're all ready to get started? Sounds great. Great. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Looks like we have a great group from across the country and perhaps a few outside the country as well. Uh, so my name is Trina Isaacson. I'm principal of 27 Shift. It's an independent consultancy where I focus most of my time doing deep thinking on the future of the nonprofit sector through activities like research or providing strategy and facilitation. Um, and I also take sticky projects off the corner of executives' desks and run with them. But I also have a variety of side passion projects, and one of them is called the Quiet Changemaker Project. And I've been spending the past, I think, over two years now, interviewing a variety of introverted or quiet folks in the nonprofit sector or who work in other areas of uh, social change or social good. And from those interviews and my own personal experience, uh, I'd like to share some of the things that I've learned that may be helpful for you in your own career in the nonprofit sector. And before I get started, I do want to mention, I, as many introverts would prefer to do, I work alone from home and I have a foster cat. So if you hear the odd meowing, um, I have her in another room, but just in case you hear, that's, that's the situation. Anyways, let's get started. So to begin, I do really want to emphasize that introverts are not shy, they're not socially anxious. Introversion is all about people who get their energy from time spent alone. So again, nothing to do with shyness or social anxiety. It's possible for extroverts to actually suffer from shyness or social anxiety. It's just even dif more difficult for them because they want to be around people and so therefore um, we don't necessarily see them and, and associate it with extroverts. But introverts, again, at their core is all about getting energy from time spent alone. And an analogy that I like to use for this is the idea of an energy coin bag so if you can picture an extrovert at the beginning of the day with an empty coin purse, and each interaction that they have with another person throughout the day leads them to put a coin in their coin purse, meaning that at the end of the day, if they have a whole lot of social interactions, they then have a really full coin purse and they have lots of energy. Whereas an introvert starts the day off with a full coin purse, and every interaction that they have throughout the day results in a coin being taken out of their coin purse. And so if they have a lot of social interaction throughout the day, it means at the end of the day, their coin bag is empty and they need time to rebuild and refill and recharge that coin purse. And so again, at its core, I cannot emphasize this enough, introversion and introverts, um, it's all about where you get your energy from and introverts get their energy from time alone. Now, stemming from that, there are a variety of characteristics that um, are aligned with introversion. And so I've got this list here that may or may not resonate with you, um, but a lot of these items are associated with, with introverts. Now, some of you may be familiar with the term introvert because maybe you've taken something like the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator. Um, some people are fans of, of tools like that, some people aren't. Uh, and what I want to emphasize, and, and I, what I truly believe, is that all models like the MBTI are wrong in some way, but some models are useful, and so tools like talking about introversion and extroversion are, are valuable and useful because we can learn about ourselves and how we interact with others and how um, the way that we do things may impact others in the way that they see us. So again, the models may be wrong, but all models or some models are useful. Um, one thing to note is that sometimes introverts are actually mistaken either by themselves or by others as extroverts. Introverts can actually be really talkative, and we can even sometimes dominate discussion, especially if it's a topic that we're passionate about or if we're in a small group of people that we're really comfortable with. So um, whether or not someone is outgoing actually doesn't necessarily correlate with being introverted. Uh, again, it's really all about energy and where you draw your energy from. Uh, I do want to note that there's a lot of diversity among introverts. We're definitely not all the same people. Some people are really driven by logic. Some are really driven by personal relationships and values and feelings. Um, some of us really like data and numbers, and some of us are really big picture, future-oriented people. Again, we're not all the same. Uh, I also want to emphasize that a lot of the, the ideas that I talk about today and the advice that I give um, is focused on intro introverts, but the way that we interact with other people at work and the, other w and the ways that people perceive us at work is not just about introversion, extroversion. It can be about you know, gender, race, class, uh, education level, language. And so 
the, the package that you are is obviously multifaceted and diverse and there's a lot of things that intersect. And so the advice that I give today is really about the introverted part of you, but obviously um, we in and of ourselves are very diverse and multifaceted people. So uh, if you look at that little blue box in the bottom right corner, it says that introverts often feel misunderstood or like people don't know them fully. And this is because often the best parts of ourselves we we keep inside of us. And so I want you to just reflect briefly um, for those listeners who do identify as an introvert um, and maybe feel misunderstood or not fully understood, what do you wish your colleagues knew about you? What do you wish that they would know more about you? And how might you be able to communicate that to them? So just reflect on that and, and consider that as a possible action to take in the future at work. Speaking of, people who identify as introverts. I'm actually curious who is in the uh, in the podcast room today, or sorry, not podcast, the webinar room today. So the first poll question is, uh, do you identify as an introvert? Yes, no, I'm not sure. I identify as both, or I hate labels. So uh, pick one, and I wanna hear who uh, who's in the room today. Great, so I'm just going to jump in there for a second, Trina, and, and just let everyone know you can vote right on your screen. Just click the option that works best for you. And uh, great, I'm going to go ahead and close and share this poll because uh, we've um, got everybody voted, I think. So do those numbers surprise you, Trina? Uh, um, let's see. Uh, not really. We've got a really strong contingent of, of introverts here today, so great to see that I'm speaking to the right people, um, but also a pretty uh, strong cohort of people that identify as both. And that's fairly common. There are definitely people who identify as both be enjoying being around others and enjoy spending time alone. There's a phrase called ambivert that comes up once in a while um, that's not related to the MBTI. There's obviously a lot of, of research and psychology around this topic, but Definitely not surprising that that people are, are identify as both. But if you add 73 and 17 percent, that means that there are 90 percent of participants today that identify in some way as an introvert. So um, pretty awesome group. And also the two percent that that hate labels. Uh, I feel you. That's that's great to see you as well. So um, today's topics here are the the seven major topics that I'll be covering today. Uh, Pretty simple, seven slides, seven topics. There'll be a few poll questions throughout and a few resources at the end along with Q&A. Um, the first four topics, the ones that I'm really focusing on, are, are topics that introverts often struggle with or topics that people don't often associate with introverts. So I really want to dig into those. And I do want to highlight that my advice today is intended for an introvert audience. So if you identify as an extrovert, you may think that some of my advice today is silly uh, or even rude. So before we get into to the section on managing quiet change makers, the advice is really for introverts only. So if you don't identify, like I said, you may find the, uh, the topics kind of silly. And that's okay because the, the, you are not the intended audience. The intended audience are introverts. All right, so first topic is around uh, building your network and networking. And so the, first, uh, the next poll question is around networking. Do you love it or do you hate it? Uh, curious to see what you think. Great. So once again, everybody just go ahead and vote on your screen. And we'll just leave it up here for a few more seconds and let a few more people vote. Those are some interesting numbers, Trina. OK, great. I'm <laughs> going to share this out here. So what do you think? Uh, let's see. I, they don't results aren't on my screen quite yet. Looks like we've got a split, 48% I hate it, 47% I'm somewhere in between. I hear uh, you. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. So not a lot of networking lovers, and so I, I feel you, but um, I definitely used to think that I hate it, but I want to share with you some of the ways that I've found uh, to cope with it and also even enjoy it and, and also some tips that I've heard from other quiet change makers in, uh, that I've interviewed over time. So uh, the first thing that I want to mention is that often what we think of as networking, when we hear that word, we associate it with going to a big room with a whole lot of people that we don't know. And if you are anything like me, that idea just like totally is horrible 
and I would rather go home with a cup of tea and maybe some TV and uh, totally avoid those sorts of events. Um, but instead of networking in that sense, which is often like, I consider it like email spam, but in human form where you're just going around and handing out business cards, obviously that's not a very effective way to do things. I want to focus on building your network. So it's not networking, it's building out your network. Um, and so the first column are tips related to uh, going to events in order to build your network. I think it's really important when you go to events with the intention of building your network, whether it's professional or for, uh, for work-related reasons, that you really identify why you are going to that event in the first place. For example, if you're going to learn from a speaker or learn from others, that means you don't actually have to interact with others all that much. But maybe you're going to make friends or gain clients, donors, or job prospects. Um, I really want to emphasize that I believe it's important to not waste time on conversations that don't meet your goals. And, it's, and in doing that, you are preserving your energy by uh, not focusing on conversations that don't add value. So when you're chatting with people early on, you're qualifying them. You know, are they, are they meeting my needs for being here today? Finding out the person's organization or their position or, or drilling down deep to get to shared interests really quickly. Um, in order for you to focus time on quality connections and not spending energy on those that don't. Again, I think that this is an act of, of self-preservation. It allows you to not waste your own time and not waste other people's time by only focusing on the connections that add value and meet the goals of you being there that day. The only exception that I would say to that is, uh, is to be generous to people that don't have a lot of power in the situation that you're in. So, for example, um, if you're going to a nonprofit sector networking event, uh, be generous to people that are young in the sector or who are re-entering the workforce or perhaps are entering the Canadian workforce for the first time. You know, are there ways that you can mentor, help, or connect them? Um, I think that that is a, a really important way to be generous with your time. So, my favorite networking opportunities are those that repeat for example, monthly events or annual conferences, and I go to these often. Uh, there's a conference that I went to just like last week that I've been to every year, um, almost every year for the past seven or eight years, and when I go, people recognize me, I recognize them, and we allow to, it allows us to bypass the small talk and get to um, really important conversations that focus on continuing the relationship, and this is why I love going to events that repeat. Um, for events that don't repeat and maybe that you don't want to go to but are required to for your work. Uh, something that I did for a long time, even before I realized that I was an introvert, is to volunteer for roles that don't require me to stand around and mingle. So um, offer to be an event photographer, uh, work the registration booth, interview attendees for a blog post if your organization has a blog. These types of activities provide you a purpose um, and gives you a reason to speak to people and also doesn't require you to initiate small talk. It allows you to get right to the point. You're registering them. You're interviewing them. You're taking their photo. Um, these are all really great ways for, for people who are at an event that they don't really want to be at, that's not providing value to them, but it's important for their work um, to both provide value to the event and not have to engage in small talk. For those of you who are, attend work events, that are outside of work hours, if you have a boss that allows this, and it can be tricky, um, as much as you can take time off in lieu, so by starting the next work day perhaps a little bit later, or starting the day uh, of the event itself a little bit later, if you have a boss that isn't flexible with time in lieu, um, I think a, another great idea is to uh, see if you can work from home for a bit in exchange for the time, or hold yourself up in a boardroom, and just have some quiet time where you can work alone and uh, re-energize after that, that networking. Now, the second column, the stay in touch and, and short emails, is not about building your network, but more about maintaining your network. And this is, to me, the easy and fun part. Uh, and my advice here is kind of more for professional networking, for example, if you're looking for future jobs or connections, um, but are transferable to other purposes as well. And one, one reason that I find that introverts like myself find maintaining relationships and maintaining networks difficult is that we don't like bothering people. We don't like emailing or calling people 
and feeling like we're intruding on their time and their energy, and instead we don't send them messages at all and therefore get forgotten and we lose our networks. Um, and sometimes we may think that people don't even remember us and so we don't email them or connect with them. And so another way that, or a way that I prefer to look at maintaining networks and building networks is to not bother them by staying in touch with really short, easy asks on their time via email. Um, send them something that's easy to read, just easy to scan, easy to respond, but perhaps something that doesn't even require a response, and also easy to delete. So the purpose is at a minimum just to help them remember you, hopefully more, but it's not for a big ask, it's just for them to remember you. And so when I think about maintaining a network, I divide a network into two groups. And the first group are important ties, but maybe are weaker connections. So these might be connected, influential, senior people who are likely busy and therefore don't have a lot of time to deal with uh, individual people in their networks. These may be people that you have a more formal relationship. These might be uh, people like recruiters or CEOs at past organizations that you've worked with. But for this first group, um, you know, you can send an easy follow-up after the first time that you meet them. But beyond that, every six to 12 months, just send them a short email outlining what you've been up to. And I credit Manager Tools, which is a podcast and a website for this advice. Um, so this short email could be something as simple as, you know, um, hey, Jenny, uh, this is Trina from the blah, blah, blah event. Just want to send you a short message with what I've been up to recently in case you hear of something that might be a fit for me. In the past three months, I've done these three things, or I've achieved these three things over the past three to six months. Uh, in the next six months, I expect to achieve these three things. Thanks, bye. So really simple, really scannable, and easily deletable. And um, again, we don't want to burden their time, but we do want to provide them information that might help them make connections for you in the future. If you want to go a bit beyond that, another option is to um, appeal to their wisdom or experience, so maybe ask to interview them for a blog post or a podcast if you do either of those, um, ask for an informational interview, or even ask them for smaller things like, you know, a good nonfiction book that they recommend. These last ones aren't as easy to respond to, so I really recommend that you use them wisely and, and not do it ingenuously, but um, these are options to have a bit more of a richer conversation with them. So instead, I do prefer the, the first easy email option. Now, the second group are more like what I call your professional friends, and they may even become your personal friends. These are peers. These are people that you'd like to stay in touch with over time and perhaps imagine a professional friendship with them over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So for this second group, I like to send little quips, just you know, a short message over email or Twitter, something that made you think of them, you know, perhaps providing a connection for them, congratulations, appreciation, or a small ask even. And to explain what I mean by this, I'm actually going to verbatim share some, some examples of little notes that I have sent out over the past month to people in my own network. So the first example, I have a friend who is CEO of a, of a nonprofit organization, a professional friend. And I got their organization newsletter saying that they had received a fairly substantial federal government grant. And so I wrote her an email with six words. I said, kicking ass as per usual, congratulations. And that was it. And granted, that language is fairly informal, but that's the kind of relationship that we have. And it doesn't require response. It's easily deletable, but it lets her know that she's on my mind, I'm thinking about her, and helps her to remember that I'm in her network. She happened to respond, um, but it's not a requirement. Another example I sent to a connection in a different city, I, I said to her, I was out in Ottawa last week to facilitate an event, but it was a quick turnaround, so didn't have an opportunity to connect in person. I hope things are going well for you. And that's it. Uh, this is a person that I'd only really had a deep conversation with once before, but I think that she's a great person and I wanted to stay in touch. She happened to respond to me, but again, it didn't require a response. It was more just a reach out to her. Um, another email I sent out recently to uh, a previous client, someone that I've worked with before, and I ran into someone that I've never met, but one of this person's um, subordinates at an event. And so I let my client know, hey, I met Michelle at the conference last week. She asked great questions in the sessions and was a great representative for your organization. Hope you're well. And again, doesn't require a response, but it both 
uh, lets them know that I'm thinking about them and also provides Michelle a little boost in the eyes of her boss. So these are some examples of messages that I've sent to my own network to help maintain that network. Sometimes I even schedule in texts or emails to send people, for example, for stay on the job um, or a promotion or a birthday so that I can remember to send these little quips to people and help maintain my network. I'm not great at remembering little things, and so I do schedule as much as possible, even as much as scheduling in individual people into my calendar every six months. And so when their name pops up, I think to myself, have I reached out to them recently? No? Well, maybe now is a good time. So these are some really specific tips uh, on how to stay in touch and maintain your network. But it's, I just want to emphasize that that follow-up and that continuing maintenance of the network is so important. If you meet someone interesting, smart, and kind, do not lose them. Uh, those people that you really connect with are rare. Uh, and so, especially as an introvert, trying to get past the small talk and into deep conversations, if you find someone like that, do not lose them and stay in touch. An example from my own personal experience of a huge fail that I had in this area was um, a conference that I went to maybe eight or nine years ago. I was at the dinner reception and had a wonderful conversation with a, a fellow attendee of the conference. Again, he was interesting and smart and kind, and we had a really great conversation. He was a, a faculty member teaching nonprofit management, and I never followed up with him, even though he would have been a fantastic, perhaps professional mentor or someone to engage with in the future. And now he's the mayor of Calgary. This is Nahed Nenshi. And I didn't follow up, but I never stayed in touch. And I have lost him from my network. Um, he's still a great guy, but definitely not in my network anymore. So don't lose people that you connect with. Definitely follow up. And these networks are not only important to our own professional careers. These networks are not selfish. Um, these are important to our work in the nonprofit sector when we are building coalitions and collaborations to move important ideas forward. We often need help of people outside our own organization. So these networks are, are so important, especially when we think about long horizons. So again, it's not about, do I need a job in the next year? It's, you know, I might collaborate with this person 5, 10, 20 years down the road. And so if you start to build your network earlier in your career, by the time you're 20 years in, you're going to have a really robust, strong, diverse, meaningful network. Um, and so finally, a lot of the things that I've been saying are uh, focused on the introvert, focused on you. But obviously, if someone from your own network asks you for help or advice, definitely reciprocate and say yes uh, as much as you can within reason. So should be without saying, but needed to say it. Anyways, so that's, uh, that's building your network, something that I'm quite passionate about. The next topic is about promoting your own work, and I have another poll question. How do you promote yourself at work? So I talk my work up in meetings and around the office. I email my boss what I've been up to. I let my good work speak for itself. So how do you promote yourself and your work uh, at your organization? Fantastic. So we'll just leave this up uh, for a few more seconds and let everybody have a chance to weigh in with how they feel. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to close and share this. Now, Trina, it's looking like maybe unsurprisingly 72% let their good work speak for themselves. Uh, I, then they've, yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. Not surprised, <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. surprised. And unfortunately, my first piece of advice is your good work will not speak for itself. I wish we all had bosses and clients and whomever that just could magically see the value that you provide their organization, but unfortunately they have so much stuff going on, unless they have concrete examples of what you've done, um, you may be getting passed over for promotion or a new job or a new project, and so uh, if I can say nothing else today, your good work will not speak for itself. It's really important for all of us to take our career trajectory into our own hands. And this is especially important if your introversion intersects with other personal attributes that might impact your ability to move forward in your work, so related to gender or, or race or other factors. So, so important to take your career trajectory into your own hands. Unfortunately for introverts, we often don't like to brag. And so how do we share our work 
without without bragging. So one of the things that I recommend is to keep a record of your achievements. So that way, weekly or monthly, you can share those items with your boss, whether that means in an email or in a one-to-one -one meeting, if you happen to have those with your boss. It really depends on them. Um, the last time that I worked in an office, I shared a weekly email with my boss saying, you know, here are the things that I achieved in this past week. Here are the things that I'm working on next week. And here are some challenges I, I might come up against and how I'm going to deal with them. And you know, maybe ask for help if help is needed. This was a boss that I didn't have a weekly one-to-one -one meeting with. And you know, a couple of times she said, hey, I really appreciate those emails that you send because it allows her to feel like she's staying in touch with me. And also, if her boss asks, you know, what's Trina working on, she's able to update them because she is refreshed with what you have been working on. Um, Keeping a record of your achievements is also really helpful when you're updating your resume. And in today's environment where jobs are becoming more and more, um, uh, more and more, I guess, or less and less stable, really important to have an updated resume. So definitely keep a record and share that record with your boss in a way that is suitable to your boss. Uh, another tip that I have is to share your work in progress. So uh, introverts are often people that keep their work private to themselves until they have something perfect to show um, others around them. Very important if you can, if perhaps if you have an own, own blog or if you have people in your office that might have knowledge that would, you could benefit from in your, pro, uh, in your uh, sorry, project, is to share your work in progress and ask for feedback, uh, maybe share it in a meeting for feedback, and let them know that it's in progress. It's not a finished copy. It's a draft. It's a version one. And be very clear that it's not your finished project, but that you do want progress or input, and that will allow you to create an even better final project, um, and also allow them to see what you're working on and what you're achieving. And finally, um, one way to talk about what you've achieved and not feel like you're bragging is by focusing on the contribution of others. So talk about what you have achieved by sharing how other people have helped you along the way. So you can talk about a project, how it was successful. Um, and, you know, it's obviously very clear, hopefully, that you led that project, but talk about how other people contributed to that project. Um, before I go on to the next slide, I do want to remind you that the session is being recorded, so if for some reason you have to pop out, you'll be sent a link after the podcast to access the um, recorded video of the podcast. All right. Next, we are going to another poll question. What's your current work team setup? So do you have an office with a door, which would be awesome? Are you in cubicles? Are you in an open office space, or do you work from home? Oh, some really interesting results coming in. That's for sure. Maybe uh, not entirely surprising, but uh, this is great. Let's share this with everyone so that uh, all of you can take a look at this and envy those lucky people that get to work <laughs> from home. <laughs> yes. I know. That's a pretty solid contingent of people working from home. All right. So the results aren't popping up for me, Marina. Can you share some of those? Absolutely, yes. Oh, we have. Uh, oh, did did you see them yeah, now? No, I see them. I see them now. Yep. So 41% have an office with a door. Where are all these nonprofits with offices with doors? That's amazing. Um, but a good contingent are working in fairly open workspaces. 13 and 25%, and then like 20% working from home. That's pretty awesome. Um, I know that in speaking with a lot of quiet change makers. Often people who are introverted end up in roles that are, are a part of a team but are fairly independent, allowing them to work from home or working in more unique situations. So for example, in my first job in the nonprofit sector, I worked in a fundraising department, but I was a special events manager. And so I was the only person on our team who wasn't directly dealing with donors and funders and, you know, um, donor databases, I was doing event management. And so I was in a team, but on my own. And a lot of quiet change makers find themselves in roles like that. So um, 
I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised. I was expecting more people to be working in cubicles or an open office, but I think that might tell you something about the people who are, um, well, it does tell us about the people that are, are joining this, this webinar today. So related to our work environment, you know, often we cannot control the physical space that we're working in because the way that our office happens to be, and perhaps our bosses are not interested in delegating in telecommuting or more flexible work arrangements. So instead, what can we do that's in our own control to create a better work environment for us? Now, introverts often keep their heads down and just get work done, but I strongly believe one of the most important things to do early on in a job is to meet people in your office. Um, it definitely can be exhausting. It might mean that you leave the end of the workday uh, completely depleted and you need to absolutely recover to t with time alone. But by meeting people, um, it means that when you need people in the future or when people need you in the future, you know who to go to, you have those relationships, and those relationships are very important. So if you, are, you find yourself working on a new project or uh, working in a new office environment, literally spend the day going from cubicle to cubicle, introducing yourself to people, and letting them know who you are, finding out who they are, and building those relationships from the beginning. Now, if you find yourself in a position where you get to hire others or you get to build a project team or, or build out a committee, really important for us to not only default to people who are like us. Um, if we bring in people that are only like us, we're going to be missing some important components of a successful project. So projects need doers, they need promoters, they need people to ask difficult questions, they need people who are really concerned about the, the self-care of the team. So a diverse team is a successful team, and it's very important for us to, to bring in those different skills and different preferences together for projects. Um, sometimes it can be really difficult, but just because people do things differently from us doesn't mean they're worse or better than us, it just means they're different. Um, I know I have a tendency, there's certain personality types that really rub me the wrong way. I can feel this strange mix of both um, annoyance and jealousy, and that's a really weird mix to have because it says that, you know, I don't like what they're doing, but I also kind of am jealous at, at what they're able to achieve. And so that shows me that those skills that they have and the type of work that they do is important. It's just different in the way I do things. So again, not worse or better, just different. And a way to kind of uncover the way that differences work and how some differences can be beneficial is to do some self-exploration. Um, if you haven't yet, you know, maybe doing the MBTI or uh, DISC or some of the other psychometric profiles that allow you to learn about yourself. These provide really great understanding of why some people work the way that they do and can help us in uh, decrease conflict. For one minor example um, is comparing how introverts and extroverts have conversations. So introverts often spend time speaking, they pause, and then a new person starts. And there's a pause in between each person speaking, where when extroverts speak, they often start speaking before the next person is finished. Some people might call this interrupting, but extroverts would call that excitement, and they're engaged in the conversation. It's demonstrating that they're interested and involved in the conversation. So whereas introverts might see extroverts as rude and interrupting, extroverts might see introverts as uh, boring and not engaged in the conversation, maybe even disrespectful. And these are just differences. They're not better or worse. They're just different approaches to conversation. So doing that um, self-exploration and learning others' preferences, sharing your own, allows for decreased conflict at work. Um, another way to, to use your skills in the workplace and working with others is use your skills as an observer. Using, use them as an advantage to help others, to help ensure that others are contributing in meetings or on projects, and you know, getting a sense of whether someone's perhaps um, you know, n not living up to their potential or perhaps their energy is a bit off because maybe something's happening at home. So use your, your observer skills to your advantage and help others to contribute. Uh, and another important thing to do at work to ensure that you are achieving your best is to prepare in advance, especially for meetings, 
um, so that you're not caught off guard and instead are able to contribute fully to meetings. So I recommend asking for agendas. Um, and if the people that you're meeting with don't do agendas, at least ask for the purpose of the meeting and ask if there's anything that you can consider in advance. Um, asking questions is good, but I do want to mention that some introverts ask a lot of questions because we seek clarity and we're curious, but be aware that your intention, while it may be clarification or improvement, others may perceive it as an attack. So just a heads up on that. All right. Next question or, uh, is on the poll related to public speaking. So how much do you love public speaking? This is the next slide topic. So much. I don't mind it in certain situations. Or where's the rock I can hide under? Oh, great. Great. <laughs> great result. <laughs> <coming in. laughs> Love good, it. Good result. Wonderful. OK, so let's just share these with everyone, because these are too good not to share. I think <laughs> there will be a lot of recognition in the audience here. Um, yeah. What do you think, Trina? I think it's hilarious. Um, so not a lot of people who absolutely love public speaking. Definitely a big contingent of people who um, uh, who don't mind it in certain situations. And then, yeah, that group that just does not like it and wants to hide under a rock. And so what's interesting is that public speaking and the ability and the enjoyment of public speaking is actually something that's not unique to introverts or extroverts. There are a lot of extroverts who are very nervous about public speaking and really don't like it. And there are a variety of introverts who love it. So um, public speaking definitely is not something that is an antithesis to being an introvert. And, and I would say one of the most interesting pieces that I've, I've come across in all of my interviews with quiet change makers is their approaches to public speaking. And over and over again, the word that I hear from them is that to them, public speaking is a performance. They come on stage, they're on, they speak, they come off stage, and they're off. And it's very much their inner role. Um, and you can see this even if you think about just generally in the world, especially in entertainment. There are a variety of introverted performers, singers, actors, dancers. I myself was a dancer when I was younger. Um, these are all situations where you are on a stage in front of many others, but you're kind of alone. So again, introverts love being alone. Public speaking is kind of like being alone, but in front of a crowd. It's a it doesn't require a lot of energy in the form of a conversation. There's no small talk that's required. You are in control of what's being said. And I mean, hopefully you have a friendly room and people aren't interrupting you. You really have control over the conversation and it's fairly one way. Um, obviously the best public speakers are able to read their audiences and you know, judge energy and understanding. And so it's a bit of a two-way conversation. But in many ways, public speaking is a perfect way for introverts to be in a big room, probably even better than in a big room of, of networkers. Public speaking is a much more comfortable place for introverts to be. Um, so if you do find yourself in a role of public speaking, I recommend not to fake who you are. So I am not a motivational speaker. I'm never going to be the kind of person that like pulls heartspring, heartstrings and, and has stories with morals to them. Um, I'm an educational speaker. I'm fairly informal and fairly frank. And so I'm just me. I can't be anything but me. I definitely can improve my public speaking abilities, but I'm never going to be a motivational public speaker, and I don't want to be. So whoever you are, just be more of you. Um, some introverts that I've spoken to in the Quiet Changemaker Project uh, one in particular, he's a little goofy. And so when he's on stage, he's even more goofy. Uh, some are really quiet. And just own that. Don't try to yell. Just use a microphone. Quiet can be really powerful. Um, if you want to just be more of yourself, I would recommend taking an acting or a body movement class to practice using the space with your hands and your and just the circle of space around you in order to improve um, your public speaking. But don't fake who you are. Um, and generally, speaking can actually be very easy for introverts, again, that being alone but in front of others, especially if it's about something that you're super interested in. Uh, I suspect some of you can be in small groups of people talking about something that you're passionate about and dominate the conversation and not be able to shut up. 
And so I do want to emphasize public speaking is not the antithesis of introversion, but it just requires maybe a different headspace or a different approach to thinking about public speaking. Now, I have a few things that as introverts we need to watch out for when we're at work. And these are things that can really uh, hold us back. The first is that because of our, our instinct to just keep our head down and get work done and not be thinking about the outside world, sometimes we can spend a lot of time alone, avoiding others without a smile on our face because we're in our own heads. And that means that people can think that we're stuck up, angry, or bored. I know in my first nonprofit job, I found out years later from friends that I had made on, uh, in that role that they said when they first met me working there, they thought I was uh, a word that, <laughs> that basically means that I was stuck up, when really I was just new in that role and I was keeping my head down and not interacting with many others and not smiling when I was walking around because I was up in my head. So just watch out for that. Um, and that's why going around the office early on and meeting people is so important. The second thing to watch out for is waiting for good work to get rewarded. I have already mentioned that, but you need to look out for yourself, and so it's so important to share your work both in progress and as you're achieving it with your coworkers and your boss and your network, as I mentioned before, that email over six to 12 months about what you've been up to. And then finally, another downfall of some introverts is keeping our thinking inside. Oftentimes, we make huge mental leaps because we've been going through this thought process in our mind, and when we share the results, the people around us can be really confused. They don't understand how we got to our conclusions. They don't understand our decision making. And it's often because, like I said, we've been thinking a lot about things for a long time, and we haven't brought people along for the ride with us. So very important to share your thinking, whether that means writing it down, sending it in emails, discussing it in meetings, but don't keep your thinking inside. It's so important to share it in order for people to get on board with your idea and uh, what you want to achieve. And so instead of um, these negative things that sometimes pop up with introverts, I want to focus as well on our strengths. So observing, listening, thinking, encouraging others, building deep relationships, and, um, and sharing our passions. These might be your strengths. Of course, you probably have a few others, and maybe not all of these resonate with you, but it's really important that we realize all jobs have elements that suit some aspects of you, and so it's important for us to reflect on how we can elevate our strengths in our current roles, or perhaps in future roles, because we don't feel like our current roles resonate with us. Um, I know as I became self-employed about five and a half years ago, I've really focused my strengths on doing research and interviewing people, um, synthesizing themes and trends and offering advice. I, I do a lot of facilitation where I get to you know, design a day and ask interesting questions and then getting out of the way and letting people you know, um, do activities and have discussions and so I get to observe and listen, draw conclusions. Uh, thankfully, I'm doing it all in service of what I'm passionate about, the future of the nonprofit sector. And, and because I'm kind of checking all of these boxes, I am a fairly energetic introvert, and because I do all of these things working from home a lot of the time, I have the energy to do networking and going to events and, and meeting other people um, because I'm able to control so much of my environment. So as much as you can, reflect on the work that you do and the job that you have and find aspects of it that can use your strengths as an introvert. Now, if you find yourself managing quiet change makers, managing introverts, so for the extroverts or the ambiverts or people that don't know, um, here are some tips for you. And I do want to emphasize that managing quiet change makers is not like rocket science. It's really just good management. So number one, sharing meeting agendas in advance. A lot of people don't write agendas for meetings, and therefore meetings end up not having a strong purpose, and they don't come to strong conclusions. So it's so important to share meetings in advance or meeting agendas in advance, both to uh, have a good meeting, but also allow the introverts on your team to think in advance so that they're able to share their thoughts in the meeting rather than having them not share and coming up with ideas too late. So, so important to share meeting agendas in advance. Uh, if you're not already, have weekly 30-minute one-to-ones with each of your direct reports. This may seem like a big burden on your time, but it will result in saved time in the long run. 
you will hear things from quiet change makers that they won't share in full team meetings. And with everyone on your team, it will allow you to stay up to date on what they're working on, um, you know, find opportunities for coaching or delegation, opportunities to provide feedback. So I think a really important practice generally for good managers and also for managing quiet change makers. This next bullet point, the subdued praise, is very specific to quiet change makers, um, not so much to, to extroverts, but praise uh, needs to be subdued. Um, most introverts would loathe a public display, display of congratulations or reward or like an engraved uh, pen or a video in their honor. Uh, if you have praise, make it subdued. Definitely you can be more effusive in private and explain to them why exactly you thought that they did a great job. But if you're um, praising them in front of the team, like keep it low key. They do not or we do not need big shows of praise and um, congratulations. And obviously for everyone in your team, if you do have constructive feedback that will allow people to improve, uh, share it in private. Uh, also more specific to quiet change makers, if you can, provide time off in lieu for events outside of work time. If the events are happening during work time, just provide them um, some quiet time the rest of the day. Perhaps allow them to work in a boardroom or allow them to work from home just so that they can recharge. And then finally, ask your staff to write out their thinking, meaning that for introverts who are often up in their heads, it allows them to get their thoughts down on paper. Um, it allows you to get more benefit from the smart things that they're thinking about. And then in general for your team, uh, you may have team members who are poor planners and allows them to plan better. So again, irregardless of whether you work with quiet or non-quiet or introverted or extroverted people on your team, asking, uh, asking staff to plan or to write out their thinking is a really great practice. One thing I don't have written on here but I, I hope doesn't need to be said, one good management uh, piece of advice is to not make fun of introverts or bring attention to their introversion. That's definitely a no-no. Um, if you find out that one of your staff members is an introvert and then you kind of jokingly continuously reference to uh, reference how, oh, they need some quiet time to themselves, ha ha ha, because they're an introvert, totally bad, bad in so many ways. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully that doesn't need to be said. So I would love for uh, the quiet change makers who are listening in, the introverted folks, um, reflect to yourself, what advice do you have for managers of quiet change makers based on your own experience as a manager or as your, uh, with your experience of being managed? Um, what do you enjoy in working with the bosses that you've worked with and what tips would you have for other managers of quiet change makers? So just think on that. Um, before we wrap up today, I do want to share a couple of resources. Um, Success as an Introvert for Dummies is a fantastic book that really highlights uh, a variety of themes related to introverts and how they interact in the world. It's definitely like a starter book. I really enjoy the Dummy series in general, but um, great overview if you want to dig into this a bit more. And that's also true of the next book, The Introvert Advantage. This was a book that was recommended to me when I first discovered I was an introvert back in 2006. Uh, it was very a very formative experience. I, I learned that my desire to spend time alone was not a character flaw, but instead just a character trait. And this book really helped me explore my strengths and learn that I'm an okay person. Uh, Show Your Work is a great book uh, for people who do creative things. So that could be something like art, but it also could be you know creating programs or new ideas related to serving your clients. So. Um, it's a fairly simple book. I actually would recommend it to share with people who are maybe graduating from high school or university and are, are creative people. Um, but it gets at you know, showing your work and sharing your work in progress, those types of things. Uh, Manager Tools is a podcast and a website. I love it for their very, very frank and very, very, um, very specific advice for being a good manager. If you're interested specifically about management as it relates to introverts, they have a couple of podcasts in their archives that reference DISC, D-I-C, uh, D-I-S-C, which is a psychometric assessment and uh, kind of a personality profile thing. And if you particularly look for S and C, those are the two, uh, the two types of people that have um, 
that have connections to introversion. So you can look at their archives. They have some really great, great podcasts. Highly recommended. I love it. Um, Susan Cain's book, Quiet, probably the most popular book on introverts, and she has a TED Talk that's hugely popular that goes along with it. Um, this book is a little deeper. It is it includes a lot of research, pop psychology, and interesting stories. So it's definitely a more in-depth read than the first two books, but um, definitely um, almost like the introvert's Bible. And then the, fi the final purple circle there is the Quiet Changemaker Project. That's my own initiative. If you uh, head to Facebook, there's a new private group called the Quiet Changemaker Project. You can search for that and join it. My goal is for it to be a place for Quiet Changemakers to ask for advice and give advice, share resources. So if you uh, want to ask questions that didn't get answered today, definitely join the group. And I would love to um, start to see some volume. It's just getting started. So I'd love to see you there. Um, if you want other ideas, just do a search for introvert in your public libraries database. There are literally tons of books. Um, I'm currently reading one right now called The Introvert Entrepreneur, but there are so many books, especially after Susan Cain's uh, TED Talk came out. So many books and super interesting. All right, so now is the time for Q&A. My contact information is up there if you want to follow up with me outside of the webinar, but um, let's get to questions. Great. Thanks, Trina. So first of all, I was hoping you could just uh, one more time let us know the um, tests that you were talking about, the, the profiles. I know you mentioned uh, oh, yeah. DISC, you mentioned MBTI. If you could just uh, go through those one more time just so everyone sure. has an opportunity to jot that down. So MBTI stands for Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and this is probably the most popular tool that you'll find in like an HR seminar or a team building seminar. Um, you generally need to find a certified practitioner or certified facilitator. I'm, I'm certified to facilitate the MBTI. Um, and you can find that if you uh, Google MBTI or psychometrics, you can find people in your area. There, there will be people in your area that can facilitate that. Um, DISC is D-I-S-C. It's another psychometric um, tool. It is, I've done it myself through the Manager Tools website. Um, and it's available through other websites as well, but that is a tool you can do online, whereas the Myers-Briggs, if you're doing the real thing, um, you're, you're usually requiring a person to facilitate it with you. Um, and then there are other, there are other um, tools like Enneagram and True Colors. There are a variety of tools where an element of it, it relates to introversion, but DISC and, and MBTI are ones that I find most useful. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and let's uh, kind of go back uh, to the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about networking, because we had a few questions sure. about networking come in. So first of all, uh, do you have suggestions for a good icebreaker when you're um, just starting to, to chat with someone? Oh, that's a really great, a really great question. So I, I want to go in two directions with this. One, if you're a person that's responsible for designing an event that kind of involves networking or getting people to meet each other, create an activity that provides a purpose for people to interact with each other. Um, so often, if you start off an event and just tell people that they can mingle, they won't, especially the introverts. And so instead, um, an activity that I enjoy is the human bingo, where you have like 25 squares you know, find someone who's traveled to more than 10 countries, find someone who can speak French and English, uh, find someone who biked to work today, and it provides a purpose to interact, and that looks really great for introverts. Um, extroverts may not need it, but either way, it gets everyone interacting. Um, if you are in a one-to-one -one situation, which this question asker may be referencing, so what do you, what sort of conversation starters do you have with people? Um, I tend to ask questions like, um, so what exciting do you have going on right now? Or, you know, what are you spending most of your time working on? Or what triggered you to attend tonight? So those sorts of questions kind of get a little bit deeper rather than like, oh, is this the first time that you're here? Those sorts of questions don't go very far, but I try to find out something interesting that the person's working on, and it could be related to their job, or, or it might not be. Um, questions like, so what's bringing you joy in your life right now? Or what, um, you know, what, 
is there a, a book or a or a presentation that you came across recently that really um, got you interested in a new topic? So I like asking questions that kind of go deep right at the beginning, a, and it gets you to potentially find shared interests um, early on in the conversation. Great, and uh, let's move on to uh, our workspaces. Yeah. Um, first of all, do you have any suggestions for people that are working in open space offices and mm -hmm. how they can cope with that? Yeah, headphones. <laughs> if you look in a room, the, the people with headphones are probably introverts. Um, so headphones is one thing. Um, you may try to communicate with your coworkers non-verbally about whether or not you are open for interruption. So whether that might be like, if I'm wearing a hat, it means like I'm working on something uh, deeply, so please don't disturb me. Or if this, if I put this red block on my desk, it means do not disturb. So if you are able to communicate with others that you uh, can't be disturbed because you are working on something deeply and you're trying to just recharge your energy, um, using some sort of nonverbal cue that your workmates can understand and see clearly, I think is a great tip. Um, that requires open communication with your team and Introverts make up 50% of the population, so don't feel like you are the freak among 20 people if you ask for that some that sort of um, that sort of accommodation in your workplace by being able to communicate your preferences by you wearing a silly hat or wearing your headphones. Like if my headphones are in, it means do not disturb. Um, send me an email, and I'll you know we can book a time to meet. So yeah, nonverbal cues is what I recommend. Wonderful. And um, for those that are working from home and maybe have to transition back into working in an office maybe a couple of days a week or maybe they've been working from home for a while and now are, are heading back to a regular office job, do you have any tips on transitioning? Oh, that's really tough. I, I did that last year. I spent two months working in an office on a short-term assignment and to be quite frank, it was exhausting. The change uh, was very difficult and and so I think it's really important to watch your energy levels. It might mean that you have less energy in the evenings for social commitments or learning and networking events. That might mean changing your schedule so that you take a break from some of those things, especially early on. Um, see if you can, um, so introverts, although they gain energy from time alone, they can also gain energy from intimate conversations about topics of interest. And so see if you can find people in your new office who are similar, who like having deep philosophical conversations about something that you share an interest about, something related to the organization's mission or something not related. So try to seek out those fellow deep thinkers to have philosophical conversations with and that can help spark your energy as well at the workplace. Um, but it's a difficult transition and I'm not going to lie, there's no perfect way uh, to do it, but rethinking your schedule outside of work hours and and finding your kind of your work soulmates is also a recommendation that I have. Great. And so now let's talk a little bit about working with extroverts. We had one person who uh, who asked, you know, do you have any tips for working with the hyperactive, super chatty, you know, energizer bunnies in the, in the crowd? And I'm sure a lot of introverts on the call can relate to that. Um, do you have any suggestions for sort of how to have that? classic introvert versus extrovert conversation? Yeah, it's it's difficult when people aren't aware that there are differences in how people work and how people prefer to work. So in situations like that, uh, it's really handy if you have a team that's willing to do some sort of um, team building exercise through an MBTI or DISC so that you can learn about each other's preferences and you can learn that people work differently. Um, it's also really important to communicate clear boundaries. I mean, usually very talkative people don't necessarily realize that you may not be as energetic about what they want to talk about as you are. And so being really clear, like, um, I love to talk to you about such and such, and right now I'm focused on, on something else, so can we set a time at once, or can we meet over lunch to, to chat? And, and setting boundaries so that you're not inundated all the time. Um, and then sometimes in an act of self-preservation, if these are people that are not necessary to your work, it may mean avoiding them. And that may seem rude, but again, self-preservation, um, limiting your interaction with those types of people can be an important tool to maintain sanity at work. 
um, if that's possible. Great. And from a manager's perspective, um, we had somebody ask about uh, the weekly meetings. They're currently doing monthly meetings, and they were just mm -hmm. curious about the benefit of switching to a weekly meeting. Yeah, so oftentimes when you're, the, the reason that I think a weekly meeting is so important, especially when you are a manager of people who are doing the work, like if you're at a director or an executive director level, um, things may be a little bit different, but if you're a manager working with a bunch of direct reports, um, they often have tasks that they're working on, and it's easy for things to get behind schedule, and if you're meeting weekly, things are less likely to get behind schedule. And also, things pop up on an irregular basis. So if a, if a person's having an issue at home that's impacting their day-to-day -day work, um, waiting for a month to be able to have a space for a conversation about that can be a really long time. And uh, you may feel like you have an open-door policy, but some introverts may feel like they're bothering you if they try to schedule another meeting in addition to that monthly meeting. So. One-to-one um, -one meetings, I think, are really important, and I've really appreciated them when I've been in work environments and had those. Um, the Manager Tools podcast that I mentioned digs in really deep into one-to-one -one meetings and why they're important to have weekly and not bi-weekly, and the value that they provide and what kind of format they can take and what sort of questions to ask during one-to-one -one meetings. So if you want to dig more into that, I highly recommend the Manager Tools podcast and website and just uh, Google one-on-ones. Great, and let's finish off today, Trina, with just a few self-care tips for introverts. Sure. Uh, yeah, self-care, uh, I mentioned the word self-preservation a couple times, and so I, I, mean, I mean the same thing as self-care. And so for me, self-care is all about energy level awareness, so checking in with yourself and figuring out when you need a break from what you're doing and when you need to uh, hibernate for a while. And so sometimes that may mean... Um, seeing if you can work from home for a day or work from a cafe. There's a joke that cafes are where introvert, uh, introvert entrepreneurs go to socialize, meaning that they work on their laptops with headphones and don't actually socialize. Um, and so seeing if there's flexibility in your work arrangement to take some time alone. Um, introverts also often are, uh, really gravitate towards nature and being alone in nature. So seeing if you can create time to either you know, walk to or from work in part at least, or spending parts of your weekend getting outside into nature, whether that's a city park or actually getting out into the mountains or, or near an ocean or a lake or a river and, and taking a walk. So, um, so definitely enjoying the solitary activities that can recharge you. I know some quiet change makers that I spoke to or I've interviewed over the past few years, one of them really loved horses and so she spent her weekend um, with horses and her horse out on a hobby farm. Um, it, it's really up to the individual and understanding what sort of individual solo activities you really enjoy and making sure that you make time for them. Um, what are some other tips? For me, it really, it all comes down to awareness. And if you feel yourself burning out because you are expending so much energy focusing on interacting with other people at work, that may require a sick day to recharge if you get too run down and your mental health is at stake. So definitely be aware of your energy levels and don't be ashamed to be frank when you need some space and you need some time away to recharge. And, um, and definitely, I, I do really feel strongly about getting out into nature or some other solitary activity um, that provides peace. Great. Well, thank you so much, Trina. This was a wonderful presentation. I think uh, we've had a lot of um, questions and comments come in, lots of activity on Twitter, and I'd like to thank everyone for not just joining us today, but for really being uh, such an active part of the conversation. And uh, I think, Trina, you've really hit a nerve with this topic and, and provided some good information. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks, uh, Robin, uh, who's behind the scenes right now on uh, the webinar and Marina and Charity Village for hosting today. Really glad to bring more visibility to this topic and um, definitely I'm happy to connect with people outside of the webinar. Definitely check out the Quiet Changemaker Project Facebook group. I would love to build that out and it'd be a safe space for introverts and quiet folks in the nonprofit sector to share their challenges and share advice. Um, so hope to see many of you listeners elsewhere. 
Wonderful. And, you know, we're going to include a link to that Facebook group. I know a few people commented they were having trouble finding it. We'll include a link okay. uh, in the follow-up email that we send out tomorrow uh, with Perfect. the recording and the slide deck. So everyone, do please watch for that in your email tomorrow. And if for some reason you don't receive it, do just pop us a message uh, and let us know, and we'll get those materials off to you. Sometimes they can get stuck in spam filters, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, in that email, we also will have a link to a short survey. So if you can take a minute to fill that out. It's really helpful for us. It helps us to further refine our content and our delivery. You'll have an opportunity there to let us know if there's topics you'd like to see covered in a future session and uh, uh, whether or not you'd uh, like to see Trina come back and, and dive into this some more. So um, I'd like to thank you all again. It was a great session and uh, I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day.